Well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Charles McJilton. I am a social entrepreneur, meaning that I use business principles and social market issues, uh, market issues to deal with social issues. I have represent four different organizations here. Uh, the one that you might know the best is the Rice Man here, Second Harvest Japan. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how to motivate, how we use a concept here called starting with why. And basically three parts to this presentation right now, I'll tell you a little bit about more about myself and what we do at Second Harvest. I'm going to show you the whole video from Simon Sinek. Has anybody seen his video? You have? Okay, good. Well, I hope you're not bored to see it again. And then I'm going to show you how we apply it at our organization and because we found that this be very important. So let's just get started. I want to show you a quick video of a little bit about what we do. So I love this picture here because it illustrates clearly what we do. All that food and all the food that you just saw in that video there would have been food that would have been thrown away. It's a cost to the donor to throw it away and no company or person in that industry wants to throw away food, but they don't know where to get it to. We come in, this is my staff, my former staff, pick it up and get out to people. For them it now has value. But in that process of picking it up, what used to be a problem, a cost to that donor company, is now a value. They can say they're doing CSR, they can say that they're engaging the community, and their staff feel better about the company, feel better about their product, knowing that it goes back in the community to, to be used that day. On the recipient side of it, obviously they can use the food to nourish themselves, but food is also a tool for communication, particularly single mother households where quite often the mothers are buying separate bentos to feed the children. Now with food, they can, they can cook together as a way to communicate. So this is really kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do, make food available to anybody in need. But to kind of understand our philosophy and where it comes from and who we are today, I need to go back 20 years ago. So I've been in now in Japan for over 26 years and lived in a poor section of Tokyo, made a self-help center there. But by the end of 1996, I had questions about the viability of that. And so I chose to go live along the Subida River and only intended to be there for three months. It's good to see you again. And I ended up staying there 15 months and it completely changed my worldview. 
It's one thing to think about poverty, one thing about hunger in the comfort of one's own home or in academia. It's quite different than when you have people living to the left and right of you, no more than two or three meters away, that struggle with that issue each and every day. And asking yourself, what should I do? What can I do? What is my responsibility here? And so while I knew these people many years before I went to go live down there, it was quite a new experience to come down here, as we say, live in the Gemba, to live side by side together, and it completely changed my mind. One day, I was looking over the river just like this, contemplating, thinking about the men. You think about how people thought about the men, and, and some people think that they're kawaiso, some people think that they're, they're jama, why are they down there? And I thought about my own life here in Japan up to that point, and some people had welcomed me, some people had not welcomed me. I'd been discriminated against. I thought about a child in Calcutta, a street child in Calcutta who was hungry, and thought about their situation, how I felt when I saw that child in Calcutta. And I thought about other social issues in the world, climate change, landmines in Afghanistan, any number of one of these things. And I came back to this phrase, back and over and over again, you may be familiar with this phrase, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. If you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Over and over in my head, I'm thinking about this as I'm looking at these men. And I thought about the men. They didn't feel that way. They didn't feel anybody else was responsible for them. I thought about the discrimination I faced, and I didn't want anybody to fight my own battles. And I thought about that child in Calcutta, and I said, you know, I didn't make that child poor or any of the social issues. And I had an experience that radically changed my whole world view and an insight that I had was quite often Westerners' sense of guilt about the world's problems is deeply rooted in an exaggerated sense of responsibility. That people feel an over sense of responsibility for the world's problems. And I shifted from feeling responsible for the world's problems to choosing to respond. And I'll give you one just quick story here to clear, clarify how that plays out in my life. Several years later, I was in Seattle with my brother, who is five years younger, but probably two times bigger than I am. He's fairly muscular. And a panhandler, a guy begging for money, had the courage to come up to both of us and say, can you spare five dollars? Typical response, typical thing, right? And without thinking, without even pausing, I turned in with no sarcasm on my voice. I said, I'll pass on that opportunity. My brother, he walked away, looked at me like this, and my brother looked at me like, what the heck? You'll pass on an opportunity? I said, well, he gave me an opportunity to do something good, and I, I just chose not to do that. Now, if I had not had that opportunity, that experience along the river, my most likely response would have been, well, if I give him the money, he's going to use it for drinking, or he doesn't look like he needs it, or some reason why I didn't need to give them food. But what I was really kind of responding to there was I'm not responsible for him. Whereas now, my worldview is I choose to respond to what we do. And we'll get into that in a minute here when we talk about what Second Harvest, what our core why is. That perspective that I had and that experience, and we talked about him the other day at Hitotsubashi, is not unique, meaning that all of us have these opportunities each and every day to step back and reflect on our life. What do day-to-day -day experiences mean to us? How do they reflect our, our values, our worldview? You don't need to live along the Sumida River to have an insight like that. And I want to share one more to you that I stumbled across in 2013. I was teaching at Sophia University NGO Management, and I stumbled across this video. I'm a leader, so this really spoke dearly to me. I said, well, let me look at it. And I said, oh my God, this guy has been, he's saying, we're doing what he says we're doing, what people, what companies do. And since that time, we've used it to refocus who we are, how we approach things. So we saw this in last year's campaign, almost played out just exactly. If you look at these two different candidates, actually the three different candidates, we clearly knew what Clinton wanted. She wanted the presidency. She had a campaign to do that, talk badly about Trump, how bad, how crazy he is. Trump and Sanders on the side, clearly we knew what their why was. 
you can debate what that exactly was, but there's no doubt among their supporters you knew exactly what their why was. And how they connected with them was different ways. Sanders, very grass, grassroots. Trump, big rallies. And the what, the idea of becoming president was almost an afterthought for both of them. You can look at online articles and people consistently say, we don't know why Clinton ran. We know she wanted to be the president, but what was her why? But these two people, it was clearly. And just as he was talking about the airplane inventors, the Wright brothers and Samuel Pepont Langley, where's Clinton today? If she was truly about her why of change in the country, it wouldn't matter if she was a politician or not. In our sense, in who we are as an organization, our core why, we don't define what we do as helping people. I'll say that one more time. We do not define what we do as helping people. We just love food banking. We just love giving away food. Now let me pause for a second and ask you, how many people were surprised by that statement? Coming from a nonprofit, how many? Would you raise your hand? You know, yeah, you're surprised, right? Right? But how many of you, when I, you heard me say, we just love food banking, you felt some energy? You felt, oh yeah. Because almost every single time when I have one-on-one -on -one discussion with people and I say this, I can see the people's face change. And it's, it's not because they agree with me about giving away food, we'll talk about that in a second, but they can clearly identify and connect with my core why. You could see the energy in my face. That came from that 20 years ago of living along the river, of choosing not to be responsible, but to responding. And my, one of my responses is to give away food. How do we do that? Trust and inequality. Trust and inequality. 70% of Japanese distrust nonprofits. 70%. Or only less than 30% say that they would trust a nonprofit here in Japan. We interface every day with the food industry, which is probably the strictest standards in the world for food and the least risk adverse. Or the most risk, risk adverse. I think I always get that mistaken. 2014, United States, there were 3,400 people died from food poisoning or foodborne illnesses in the United States. 320 million people, that's not a lot of people, okay? Within the last five weeks, over that number of people have died from gunshot wounds in the United States. So we're not talking about a lot of people. But that same year, 2014 in Japan, just three people, just three people died from foodborne illnesses. Population of 120 million, consuming nearly 89 million tons of food, or importing and using it. That is not a lot. To get to that level, you have to have NASA-like standards for your food. You do not trust anybody. We say in Japan that the product isn't perfect, pristine, or presentable. It doesn't get purchased. That's the environment we are operating in. So we need to create trust. And here's our, here are the results. Ten years ago, we only had 15 companies. Now we have over 1,300. And here's the interesting thing. We don't do any solicitation. We don't go around company to company asking for food. All 1,300 of those companies approached us and sat down with us and offered us an agreement. In all 1,300 companies, we have what we call an equal relationship with them. Why is this so important for us? It's not a matter of pride. It's a matter of our approach. That if we go around company to company and say, unintentionally it puts the company above here. It puts us down here. So that when we pass out our food, the people are down here and we're up here. We see food as a tool. Companies have pumps and patches. People over here have bikes with flat tires. If we can make that lateral transfer, that's all we want to be. That's all we want to do. That equality part is important. What I will tell a company that sits down in front of me, I'll say, we are not interested in your food. We want a trusting relationship with you and we will match you pace for pace to, to achieve that. And then I'll go on to give two examples. Nichiday Foods, the 2005 signed an agreement with us after just three short weeks. But Nichiday Foods is traditionally a very, very conservative company. A different company, which we never named, but it's an actual fact, took us five years. 
five years. See, I don't want the food from them. What I want is them to get so excited about what we do, they tell two or three other people, and here it is right here. The what we do, right? You can find that on our homepage or annual report. Obviously, we provide food to people in a lot of different ways. This is the end result of what we do, right? But when we talk about and think about us, we go from how, why, how, what in our discussions. We use this this week to work through a problem that we've had for many, many years. And the problem focuses around the issue of food loss and food waste. Big topic in the, in the media. You know, people talk about it all the time. Oh, there's one third of food is thrown away. You know, 25% uh, of food is thrown away. There's people hungry and stuff like this. Okay? But we all, being in the field, being experts in this area, knew that a lot of what was being said was uninformed, uneducated, and unsupported. And so we would always criticize these, these different activities, the Zero Yen Kitchen, Tabino Gosnai Undo, Food Loss, all these. And so my staff member came to us and says, what are we going to do? We can't run away from this issue. People are always talking about it. You know, we've got to be part of the conversation, even if no, we don't believe in, in the movement. Okay? In other words, there are 155 definitions for food loss. Even countries that have a single definition, there's no way to, to measure how much food loss is, right? If you can't measure it, you can't manage it, correct? Even the United States, my country, the government reports anywhere from 33 million to 66 million, depending on what definition they use, okay? So how are we going to square this? Well, we had good discussion, and what we realized is that we were focusing on from the what side, right? And so we came back and said, what is our why? What is our core why? We just love to give away food, right? And so my staff and I each shared a story that we own had. He went to India at one time, and so a child was begging for food. And instead of just giving the child food or money, he said, well, come and I'll feed you. And he ended up feeding 10 of his family members at a restaurant. You know, I shared in my mind as a child not having enough food, not having lunches and what that meant to me, and now have an opportunity to give away food, right? And then we thought about, well, wait a minute, these people over here, you know, what's, what's going on there at their core, their why? Well, food is life, right? Our fondest and deepest memories are usually connected to food, whether it be a wedding, holidays, when we feel bad, we get good food, Right? Maybe our, our mothers might have made us food that comforted us. But food is such an integral cool part of us. And to see that thrown away, right? I love the Japanese phrase of multi nai But we said, hey, you know what? How about we, we, we focus on it here, and then we talk about how we can use that food as life. This is the intersectionality. And avoid all this. And suddenly, we went from being confrontational each time about their what to refocusing on what is important to us and how can we talk about food loss and food waste in a way that reflects our values, in a way that doesn't alienate other people. The last one that's important with this discussion is that I can go down and tell you all the things that are wrong with here with numbers and facts and figures. But that's all that is, is facts and figures. But I tell you a story about myself right, of not having enough, you know, food for breakfast or not being able to, you know, have lunch or my, my colleague can tell you about him sharing dinner. That's a memory. That's an experience that you can remember, all right? And that can motivate us. Then how does, how can we share more food? Our vision is by 2020, that we want to make food available to 100,000 people, right? Currently, there are about 2.2 million people that lack food security. The vast majority of these people are elderly. The national population for homeless is only around 6,200 nationally. In Tokyo, it's less than 2,000, okay? 
The vast majority of people that are in need are not living on the streets. They're living in, in houses and apartments. To get access to food, this week in New York City, there are 1,100 different locations to pick up food. Even nearby Hong Kong has, 200, has 160. Tokyo, maybe six. And I'm not referring to church groups or other faith-based groups that provide onigiri in the park. I'm talking where you can pick up a basket of food to feed your family for three or four days. Okay? So we think of it like climbing a mountain some ways. And our first step up that mountain by 2020 is to reach 100,000. Our big goal, right, the big one, you know, that we, we hope to get there someday is that everybody has enough food. And we want to think of it like a, a, a public service, a public asset. I live way out in the countryside. It takes me about almost two hours to get home every day. I almost never use the public library, you know. But if I felt the public library wasn't there, I would feel a public asset was gone. And it's valuable to me. I'm happy to pay taxes to make sure that library open. Because it's not just a place for people to read books, but it's a place for people to get knowledge, a people to experience a different world, a pe place for people to share information. It's valuable to us. And that's how we want to see what a safety net is, is that even if you don't use it today, somebody in the community might be able to use it. And even if you may never experience food insecurity, you know what it's like to have everybody at the table. And if I were to ask you to take a step just for a second and imagine that every single child in Tokyo by 2020 could go to school on a full stomach, how would that feel? Now, for me personally, it makes me feel good. Even though I don't know all those children, we have plenty of food. So this is where your opportunity to respond, you know, to partner with us. Use your talents to help us to get food. Right? There's different ways you can interact with us to make that happen. I know some of you are coming out tomorrow. That's great. And then also financially. If you've ever donated to us financially, you may want to know what impact does that have. For every thousand yen you, deliver, you donate to us, we can deliver 40 meals. We arrive at that number by taking our total cost, overhead, everything, and dividing by the number of meals that we were able to deliver last year, okay? I'll leave you the last two quotes here. I love these, um, one by Martin Luther King, but he plays on Hillel the Elder. Uh, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? We reflect on that internally, that we don't want to assign this work to other people or wait for other people to take action, but we want to do something. And we want to do whatever we can do today and not wait till we retire or wait till something changes in our life. Even a small action today can have a big impact. The second one, though, speaks more deeply to us as an organization, how we see the world. It comes from Robert Kennedy. There are those who look at the things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. So instead of focusing on why is there all this food waste? Why doesn't the government do something more? Why? We want to say, what would it look like if you and I partnered? What would it look like if you and I put our heads together? What would that banquet table look like if we took some action today to make something happen? To focus on what the possibilities are. There's a lot more information on our website here. Uh, it's bilingual and you can download some information. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.